Ready? Red line. Yeah, it's the video. Yeah, we'll learn how to learn the sound of the Yes. One second, let me check this in. I can suggest it while we're Oh, right, check. Um, this is a piece. Okay, test, test, test. Are we any red lines? No, we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna hit record. Ephesians 5.33 commands the husband to love his wife and the wife to respect her husband. But what happens when we don't act on Ephesians 5.33? What happens during marital conflict when a wife feels unloved and a husband feels disrespected? I made a discovery. I call it the crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. And then without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. And this baby starts to spin. Can you relate to the crazy cycle? When your wife feels unloved, does she tend to react in a way that feels disrespectful to you? When your husband feels disrespected, does he end up reacting in a way that feels unloving to you? That raises a most significant question. How do you get off the crazy cycle? I will address how to get off the crazy cycle in this second session. But what do we know from research about love and respect? And what does the wife do who does not feel respect for her husband and needs R-E-S-P-E-C-T for herself? In the workbook, we'll be discussing several very important items. For instance, what is crucial to understand when we get on the crazy cycle? And why do we hurt each other when we get on the crazy cycle? Why is it so easy to conclude that our spouse does not have good will toward us? These are important questions, and on this topic of goodwill, the midweek devotional is titled, Do You Have a Goodwilled Marriage? When I address this in the devotional, in the workbook, you'll realize that this is one of the top pieces of information that can radically change your marriage. In fact, when I first introduced this information about goodwill, I had no idea how meaningful it would be to couples. I believe this devotional can change the way you handle those crazy cycle moments. Are you ready for session two? Let's begin. I did some research. We have asked 7,000 people this question. When you're in a conflict with your spouse or significant other, do you feel unloved at that moment or disrespected? 83% of the men say they feel disrespected. 72% of the women say they feel unloved. Now, it's very important that I say this. We all need love and respect equally. But the felt need during conflict is as different as pink is from blue, night is from day, male is from female. If you start at zero, you go to 83% <laughs> feeling disrespected, and you go the other way, 72% feeling in love. If you don't understand that, then what's going to happen is that very same conflict that you both are experiencing at this moment, she can begin to feel unloved, and you dismiss it because you're not trying to be unloving. And he feels disrespected, but you dismiss it because you're not trying to be disrespectful. And in fact, the reason you don't think about being disrespectful is because you see him as so unloving. And the reason you don't see yourself as so unloving is that she's so disrespectful. And we both are right. And what happens then is a confusion sets in. Because okay, many of us are not even trying to be right. We just feel that we are. And, 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 and I know if I'm right, then my spouse has to be. And that's a huge mistake unless there's an intrinsic evil going on. There are what we call moral issues and preference issues. If it's a moral issue where they're, they're, they're stealing from the bank or something and you differ, yeah, I mean, I get that. But almost, almost all conflicts are preference issues. I want sex on Tuesday night, she doesn't. Later in life, she wants sex, I don't, for instance, the first Corinthians 7. And the color of carpet, whether we should homeschool or go to public school. These are not moral issues. There are moral issues that can happen in those things, but technically there's nothing in the Bible that says, thus they at the Lord, don't send your child to public school. <laughs> and so here you have 
differences among good-willed people, but you can begin to feel devalued if they seem to dismiss the thing that you're trying to convey. And, and so then over years, you begin to think, I don't matter to you. And we get confused because in one sense, we know that we do, but in the other sense, it doesn't feel that we do. And, and, and there's this period of confusion. And some are pushing eject on the relationship because they're tired of this. And they see everybody else on Facebook that's happy. <laughs> I want to relabel that fake book, not Facebook. <laughs> and Paul says we measure ourselves by ourselves and we compare ourselves with ourselves and we understand nothing. It's important that you realize that the Struggles you have, we all have. I've been doing this long enough now. I want you to know that the issues that you struggle with are within the range of normalcy. Unless you are, you know, violent. But if it's the day in and day out irritations, you're in the area of normalcy. The question is, how do we do this normal? How do we deal with those troubles? Do we jump ship, go over the rail, or weather the storm, get through it? But now some people say, well, Emerson, aren't love and respect equal? Aren't they synonymous? No. You, you respect your boss. You don't love your boss. You love your teenage son who's rebelling, but you don't feel any respect for him because of his behavior. They are not synonymous. And in fact, what's interesting, these male and female differences, Shawnee Feldhahn, a friend, she surveyed 400 American males, and one of the questions that was asked of these 400 men was this. Decision analyst out of Houston did this national study representative of the American male. And the question of these men was this. Would you men rather be left alone and unloved in the world or viewed as inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Again, would you men rather be left alone and unloved in the world or viewed as inadequate and disrespected by everyone? 74% of the men said they'd rather be left alone and unloved in the world. Johnny said the women are shocked by this. Most women. Again, bell curve. See, but it, we are very vulnerable when you say to us, I feel very unloved. And I feel very alone in this relationship, and you're not adequate, and I do not respect you. Counselors do this all the time, and the men leave. And then we have the audacity to say that the men are unteachable. I spoke to 100 professional counselors, and I said, if I could show you how to get men to line up outside your door, would you be interested? Oh, yeah. Don't you ever communicate to those men in such a way that you say you are an inadequate human being, and no one can respect you, especially as you see her cry, feel alone, and unloved. That would be the same as saying, look at your husband who feels inadequate and, and, and disrespected. I'm going to tell him to leave you alone and not love you until you start making him feel adequate and respected. Women would protest <laughs> outside my clinic. So it's important that we not dismiss the other's vulnerability based on our natural strengths. And the reason that we judge our spouse is that God gave you as a woman, for instance, natural strengths in the area of love. And so when you see your husband, though, deflate over issues of disrespect, which is a marginal issue to you, we just love one another, that's all that matters. It's so easy for you to judge him because God gave you natural strengths to know credit of yourself in the area of love, and you end up dismissing him on an issue that you think is marginal and narcissistic and childish, and you don't see it as a vulnerability that he has that you don't. And you gentlemen, you see her deflate. You think, oh, come on, grow up, woman. You're so hypersensitive. But he's allowed your wife to have a, a vulnerability where you have a natural strength. And it's so easy to judge her on issues that don't bother you. Yeah. And so if we come to a point as a husband and wife where we begin to think about the holy word rather than about Hollywood, and that's a figure of speech, if we begin to process things with in our script is the scripture, not the script we saw on the silver screen. When we begin to think biblically, we begin to enjoy this relationship more than we imagine. At first glance, it's thinking like you're giving up something. No, you're not. You're actually gaining a whole ton of stuff because not all the trouble is necessarily bad. Trouble can be that you lost your five-year-old daughter to cancer, and you're not going to go to Hawaii on a second honeymoon on the heels of her funeral. And you're both going to be grieving and in depression. So one of the things we have to realize is that we are realists. And when you deal with reality and your expectations coincide with that, you will find a way to enjoy and have a meaningful friendship 
and you will work through issues and you will die two old but happy people. But you've got to figure this out. Now, at this point, some women, you know, are saying, you know, I don't know about this. I don't know, you know, and, and I want to comment on that in just a moment. But I want you to know that men process things differently. And I will tell you that they are very sensitive to this issue of honor. In fact, every man here serves and dies for honor. He throws himself on a hand grenade to die for his buddies. Honor is huge. That's how we feel love, in a sense. And we feel love when we feel honored. The way in which our affection is generated is when we honor the spirit of each other. And then there's this affection we feel. And when he proposed to you, it's because you looked up to him, you admired him, you respected him. And he felt these fond feelings of love and he proposed. But every man here would die for his wife. In fact, one man said to his wife, I love you so much I would die for you. She said, oh, Harry, you keep saying that, but you never do. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Harry, you keep saying that, <laughs> but you never do. And do Somebody women process, you know, do they process <laughs> the world through the, the uh, love grid? Uh, think of the fifth anniversary, this young couple, they've been married five years, and he saved up this money, he comes home and says, hey. I've saved up all this extra money you didn't know about. I want to take you to the restaurant of your choice tonight. I want to take you where you want to go. Where would you like to go eat? Oh, I don't know. No, no, I want to take you where you want to go. It's our fifth anniversary. Let's go celebrate. Let's splurge it. Where do you want to eat? Oh, I don't know. You don't know? No. Oh, no, no. Where do you want to go? Think about it for a moment. I don't know. You decide. You want me to decide? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, I want to take you where you want to go. Where do you want to go? No, you decide. You want me to decide? Mm -hmm. Hey, I read in that. Riverside Magazine, they, they say that they've got these steaks that are like 15 feet tall fillets. You don't have to use a knife. You just take your fork and it's like butter. You know, and it's out on that truck stop on the highway. I don't want to go there. I'm not going to go there. Who are you? I was just talking to my wife and she left. You're not the woman. Where did she go? You know, that's just it. I asked you what you want to do. And you tell me to decide. So then I decide. And then you decide that we're not going to do what I decide. Because it's not to keep you what you want to do. And then they, he's just, man, he stomps off. And he's in another part of the house. She stomps off another part of the house. Fifth anniversary, two goodwill people looking out the window and thinking, why does this happen? How does this happen? Well, gentlemen, I'm going to tell you what's going on in your sweet daughter's brain. If she's married or your daughter-in-law or your wife. Here's what's going on in the pink brain. If he loves me as much as I love him. He'll figure out where it is I want to eat without me having to tell him. Now, there are some women here who say, but Emerson, I have to be honest with you. I don't feel any respect for him. And it'd be hypocritical for me to show respect when I don't feel it. And I know you don't want to be a hypocrite. And everybody knows that respect must be earned. He hasn't earned it. He doesn't deserve it. And the dictionary says you show respect to your superiors. He's not superior to me. I'm not inferior to him. I'm not going to be treated like a doormat. I really think you want us to return to male patriarchy and fear male dominance. And I'm not going to set the feminist back 50 years. I'm not, I'm not going to go there with that. And, and I certainly am not going to give him license to do whatever he wants and just kind of say, I respect anything you want to do. And I certainly am not going to lose a sense of self or sense of identity. I certainly am not going to subject myself to emotional abuse. But, you know, other than these things, I'm really open to hearing what you have to say about this. How many of you have sons? Raise your hands. Yes. What I just share with you is what I call the mantra. That's that mantra your sweet daughter in law is going to sing toward your precious baby boy. And he's just going to shut down. He's going to withdraw. He's going to stonewall. And she will be the epitome of love. She will be sweetness personified. Uh, sincerely so. But when the doors close, women get very aggressive toward the one man that they love. And all of that is spewed out. The University of Washington said the eyes darken, the face turns sour, hand on the hips, scolding finger, the sigh, the roll in the eyes. And when estrogen kicks in, the word choice of contempt is incredible. And your precious baby boy will be like, like a deer in headlights. And he'll do the safe thing, just shut down. Because he, he doesn't know how to deal with that. He would die for her. There's no question about it. So he withdraws because it's the honorable thing to do to de-escalate what he doesn't. This is overkill. This is way too much. So he just goes quiet. He doesn't see that she's seeking reassurance of love. He just thinks she's using this topic as an opportunity to send him the message that she finds him a horrible human being because no one's ever talked to him that way before. 
See how this works? So what we have to do is revisit this for one reason. You need to be in a position to coach your sweet daughter-in-law and your son-in-law to help them with these things. But if we don't live it out, then we're bald-headed men selling hair restoration oil. But, and let me just share, share with you, love and respect. She needs love, he needs respect. But Emerson, aren't there some other ways this could go down a little bit? Yeah, I want to share something very important to you. 60% of you are in that situation tonight. She feels unloved, he feels disrespected. 20% of you, though, it's interesting, are both feeling disrespected. We've done our research. And did you know in 1 Peter 3, he addresses marriage, that the wife is to respect her husband, and then he says, husbands, honor your wives. He doesn't even get into love. He doesn't get into agape love. Peter says the key to your marriage is for both of you to show respect toward each other. He walked with the Lord of love for three years, but doesn't tell husband and wife to love each other. He said it's about honor and respect. But we become so focused on L-O-V-E in this culture, we don't even listen to what Peter is saying. And some of you are both feeling very disrespected, 20% of you. 10% of you are both feeling unloved. How can that be? Well, we understand how she could be, but Titus 2, the older woman encourages the younger women to love their husband, love their children. Your husband feels unloved because you're so unfriendly. He just thinks if we really love each other, why, why do I? Like I'm the worst human being on the planet. I just really wonder if you love me. And then also, if you've said to him, I don't love you, that's a clue. So you have to unpack this. People who come to me say, well, we're reversed. That's always a red flag to me. If you're saying that God commands you, the wife, to love and your husband to respect, no, 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 no. God's not a liar here. And almost always when a woman says, well, I, you know, I just need my husband's respect. I said, well, are you, you in love with your husband? Do you love your husband? Oh, yeah, I love him. I take care of him. I, you know, I do his laundry. So no, no, you, you, you know what I meant by that question. Are you in love with your husband? They start to cry. No. Well, then no wonder he's feeling unloved. Because he knows you don't love him and probably don't respect him. Which is one of the reasons you're not feeling love for him. And now you just want basic civility because he's reacting so negatively. You just want civility and basic respect but there's a problem here and i don't know what it is he either wounded you 10 years ago and you've closed off and that's why you stonewall you don't stonewall to try to de-escalate a problem you stonewall because you live in fear of it or he's a good-willed man who wants to love you and wants your love but you're an adulterous woman but there is a problem somewhere a hundred percent of the time i found that to be the case so you aren't reversed the reversal indicates why you have a problem. And let's be honest about that. And also when I give research, again, if these are variables, don't just say, well, I must be the man, I must be the woman. What you're doing is you're dismissing the heart of the issue. And that's a convenient thing to do. I've been doing this long enough, now I know. And you're afraid for some reason, and I understand that. And I will also tell you at a certain moment, the Lord's going to get really close to you, and he's going to really speak to you, and you're... And, but see, I'm not smart enough. I'm not like Jesus. I can't do it like him. So I'm not perfect. So I'm going to be silly. I'm going to say something. And so as you start coming under conviction, you're going to start to try to kill the messenger, not to hear the message. And what I want you to do, don't do that. Because I'm going to say something stupid to be funny or whatever. I'm going to do something that could offend you. But what I want you to do is go back. Three years ago, somewhere in a park, did you just break down and say, oh, God, through Christ, help me? And he didn't respond then. But he's responding now. I don't know why he didn't respond then. I wish he would have along with you. I, I don't know why he doesn't hurry things along at times. But if this is that moment, you've since become a little bitter. And, and I would just have you go back a little bit and keep your heart tender. And I will also say this. He's slower than I am. I've got a certain time limit I'm moving through. He's gentle. He's patient. He's not going to dump the truck. But at certain points, he's going to speak to you because he loves you. And he's, he's going to show you how to influence the situation. He's not interested in shaming you. He wants to give you some tools. And here's what he's going to say to you. You're not a victim in this situation to the extent that you think you are. If you give all that power over to your spouse, then they control everything. And so then the whole campaign has to be to change them in order for them to be what they ought to be to make the marriage easier for you. Because you know that when they're loving or respectful, you're happy. And so it doesn't take rocket science to figure out logically, if they would just do what they're supposed to be, we would be happy. And so then our campaign is to tell them to stop this negativity. If they would just be positive, you will be positive. But you have given them all the power. 
And in a sense, you've made them your God. And if your God doesn't perform, then you curse your God and you blaspheme your God. And the Lord is saying, they are not your Lord. And you are not a victim that's hopeless and helpless here. And I'm going to speak to you about how to empower you to touch their spirit. And you cannot be unloving and disrespectful to motivate them to be loving and respectful. You've got to give them a gift of something that's unconditional. And at a certain point, they'll break if there's any degree of goodwill. But you have to decide whether you want to see them come under that conviction or if at the end of the day, you're really just using excuses to keep reinforcing your negativity as though you have some just reason for doing that. And it really isn't a complaint that I'm in a bad situation. I'm complaining because it allows me to keep in this miserable state and justify my sinful reactions. So one of the things I want you to do, though, is just to, to realize that there are these exceptions on the one hand, but you've got to be honest also about those exceptions. And, and I would just say that, you know, if, if women, you really wanted respect, you know, and I, and I know the song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Aretha Franklin. Remember, I come from Motown area, Michigan area, and she sang that song. Women need R-E-S-P-E-C-T. By the way, do you know who wrote that? Otis Redding. And it was released by him in 1965 as a single, and it was a husband's song to his wife. Otis was singing this song to his wife, but they changed it to fit this Aretha coming along, the soul queen, because they like the rhythm of it, but the words don't fit. If you pay attention to the words, take all my money, 1965, women didn't have the careers at that point, so to speak. And so, you know, it's a take all my money. I don't care, woman. I, I just want a little R.E.S.P. So, gentlemen, the one song we had, they took. But if you really wanted an R-E-S-P-E-C-T, why is there not one card in the whole card industry from a husband to wife that says, baby, I really respect you? Or at the end of the movie, does the hero embrace the woman and say, oh, I, I respect you? It doesn't mean that you don't want respect, but the card industry knows what we really value. And they've tried the R-E-S-P-E-C-T card and it doesn't go. Women want to express love and hear love. And here's the deal. The best way to respect your wife is meet her need to feel loved for who she is. And the best way to love your husband is to meet his need to feel respected for who he is in the eyes of God. And that person will soften. And so, you know, what was the issue when the issue was the issue when Sarah's Swallowed my contact. At a certain point, I came across unloving to her. At a certain point, with that jean jacket, I was feeling disrespected. When that diet book was purchased, what was the wife feeling? She heard a message through the diet book, through his blue megaphone, through her into her pink hearing aids. I do not accept you. I do not approve you. I don't love who you are unless you look like a Dallas Cowboy truly. That's what she heard. That third marriage book, what does he hear through his blue hearing aids? He thinks she's sending a message through her pink megaphone using the third marriage book. I don't accept you. I don't approve of you. I don't respect who you are, Buster, unless you change and become more loving like me. That's what he hears. That's what your son's going to hear. And neither are tending to send that message. That's not the point. And, and the reason I bring this up is, as I pointed out, my dad attempted to strangle my mother to death. You saw that in the video clip when I was two and a half. And I went to bed until I was 11. My dad committed adultery when I was about 11. And then I was sent off to military school because at one point I took a butcher knife and told mom I was going to kill dad. It's false bravado. But there were, and mom realized I needed to get out of the home. And, uh, but my mom, dad, sister, and brother-in-law came to Christ. But I have wounds. But as a result of that, I begin to try to think, how, do, how does a mommy and daddy live together? How do the husband and wife live together? What does it mean for us to do marriage? And having been in a military school for five years with all guys, when I went to Wheaton, I was with girls smelling perfume. And it was like I came off another planet as an 18-year-old right into the thing of women. I, I was listening, hearing things that everybody else just took for granted. And I was paying attention. This is different. And I made some discoveries. One of which is what I call the crazy cycle, based on Ephesians 5.33. When a wife feels unloved, she tends to react in a way that feels disrespectful to her husband. When a husband feels disrespected, he reacts in a way that feels unloving to his wife, and it spins. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love, and it gets crazy. And when the issue isn't the issue, you're probably on the crazy side. And what's interesting, she feels unloved in the first place. She seeks to do the loving thing by moving toward him to confront, to connect, only to hear that she's disrespectful and feels even more in love. She has four levels of justification. And all the women in her life reinforce that. She knows she's right. 
In the other hand, he was disrespected in the first place. He seeks to do the honorable thing by de-escalating the thing, only to hear as he's walking out the door, he's the most unloving human being on the planet, feels even more disrespected. It's four levels of knowing that he's right. And what is even more interesting, without love, defensively she reacts. She knows she's defensively reacting. What she doesn't see is she reacts offensively without respect. And without respect, defensively, he reacts. He knows he's feeling insecure. I'm just trying to defend myself. But he reacts in a way that offends her. Without respect, defensively, he reacts offensively without love. And so what happens is that we're focused in our, 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 end of, our defensive reactions, and we don't understand the extent to which we're offending the other person. Then they get offended, and they feel defensive, and then they come, and this thing spins real quick. And it can really get out of control in 13 seconds. And you're never going to get off of it completely because Tuesday night is coming. But you can learn how to jump off of it quicker. And Sarah and I, that jean jacket story, the, the, the contact lens, you can start spinning. The third marriage book, the diet book, it, it just spins because you end up getting on that crazy cycle. And we've got to decode, and here's the deal. We've got to decode. Is my wife really trying to be disrespectful or is she seeking reassurance that I love her? Is it ultimately a compliment, not a complaint? And is my husband really trying to be unloving? The truth is he would die for you. And Jesus said, no greater love is a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. According to Jesus, your husband is very loving, though your husband is not as sensitive or sentimental as you are. And so here's the deal. He, is he trying to be unloving, or did you say or do something earlier that felt disrespectful to him, which completely explains why he did. So, so many people today are saying he's bipolar because he comes in and he's in a certain mood, and then 15 minutes later, he sinks. Bipolar. No. I said to you, did you say or do something during that period of time that appeared very contemptuous and belligerent to him? Yeah, yeah, but he should know I didn't. Folks, we are people of goodwill. We are sinners, but we're people of goodwill. We're married to a person who's not trying to diss us. We're married to a person who isn't trying to be unloving. But the question is, are they more insecure than we think and that they are reacting to their perception of being unloved and disrespected? And even though we think they're childish and shouldn't deflate over this because we couldn't imagine doing that, the question is, will we give them the benefit of the doubt? Or will we resent them? Because they don't react like we do. And if that's the case, you need to revisit what Jesus asked. Have you not read, you made them from the beginning, made them male and female? This is really about your belief in what Jesus said. Will you live by the holy word? Or will you live by those voices in the culture that says, your spouse ought to be like you? It's a choice we all have to come to. And it doesn't mean that it's easy. But it just means it works. And let me say again, 1 Corinthians 7, 33 and 34, the husband is concerned about how to please the wife. The wife is concerned about how to please the husband. And Paul in Romans, the great treatise on the total depravity of the human heart, he knows our sinful condition. But he says, in marriage, I want you to understand that your spouse is not ill-willed, even though they fall short. They don't have impure motives against you. He's not trying to be unloving. She's not trying to be disrespectful. And will you trust their heart when they're stepping on your air hose and everything in your being says, I would never do this. And you're correct because you're not a man or you're not a woman. So we have to trust them. We have to decode. You know, years ago, uh, this happened on a subway. True story, but I want to put it on a on a on a bus. Forty of us are heading, you know, red eye special to Chicago all night long. Everybody's on the bus except for four seats. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're going to go, but we got to leave Riverside to get to Chicago. Oh, here come. Oh, it's a, a husband. Oh, three kids. Oh, there's a father. Yeah. Oh, and so they, the father comes down the aisle and actually sits in the seat in front of you and starts staring out the window. The bus door is closed. Lights dim. The bus starts to roll off. You put your seat back. Everybody's going to get a little shot eye real quick when you hear one of the kids scream. And then another kid screams and you look up and the kids haven't even sat down. They run up and down the aisle and then you see them elbow some person in the ear and it's just kind of like chaos. And then everybody's setting up and they're looking back and the father's just staring out the window doing nothing. And they all vote you the chairperson. Oh, thanks. Sir. 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 
What? What? Your children. This is a red-eye special. We need a little sleep. They're running up and down the aisle. Would you please have them sit down? I mean, they're, it's, it's just way too loud. Would you have them sit down? He looks at you and then sees everybody with daggers in their eyes. So, sir, I'm so sorry. Everybody, I'm so sorry. Please, please forgive me. Please, please forgive them. We just came from the hospital. Their mother, my wife, just died. Now, where did your emotions go? They flip-flopped, didn't they? They flip-flopped. Everything changed, but nothing's changed. How did that just happen? How is it that everything changed, but nothing changed? In fact, nothing's going to change now. I mean, you know, what are we going to do now? But see, we went from a point of anger. I know why those kids are doing what they're doing. They're, 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 they're rebellious. They're anti-authority. And, and he's a permissive liberal parent. If those kids are my, I'm so sorry. Ah. <laughs> they're running up and down the aisle spasmodically wild. He's stonewalling <laughs> looking out of the window. Spasmodically wild. But then you got a little piece of information. That their mother, his wife, died. And your emotions flip-flop. How did that happen? Because at that moment in time, you decoded your experience correctly. Up to this point, you were wrong. Your feelings were real. And obviously, your feelings are the voice of God, right? But the truth is, from this illustration, we were wrong. See, we were taking up offense toward those kids with all this drama and out of control and all that. And we were offended by this man who's stonewalling and withdrawing. You kind of get the analogy? You're in a marital bus ride. And some of you are offended by the person who stonewalls and withdraws and ignores you. And you're offended by this person who's just all emotional and drama and just creating chaos here. But in almost every case, when that happens, there is pain. And I'm making the point to you that your wife is probably feeling unloved and your husband's feeling disrespected. I am not making the case that he's unloving and the children or your wife is disrespect. Which way are you going to decode on the marital bus ride? Let's pray together. Lord, we believe that the issue when the issue isn't the issue is a love and respect issue. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. Come close. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husband. Lord, we thank you for the richness and the wisdom of this. And now we pray as we continue in this conference that you'd give us the wisdom to be able to decode on the marital bus ride. She's not trying to be disrespectful, but in all probability has a need that only he can meet. And she's reacting this way because she is saying, I need you. I'm not trying to put you down. I need what only you can give me. She can decode. He's not trying to be unloving, but he's saying, I have a need that only you can meet. And I feel so vulnerable when I feel like you don't like me. And so I shut down. But you know, I would die for you. Oh God, through Christ, help us to begin to decode rightly what is happening on this marital bus ride. Through Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's take a break. We'll show how to get off the crazy site. You can get that from the moon if you know. Something from God, and you, if you think you can do it better, you got it better. You're a fool, and you will pay. The, you will pay the price. You will suffer the consequences. The gift from God, if you do it right, it can be hell and devil, devil and hell. If you don't, that's your choice. You can't see. Um, you can go, you can sure. go surf the web for another hour. Oh, not dead, you know. Just like that, you missed it. And was that what would you do when you surf the web? Would you go? Yeah. 
I don't really remember. Oh, I was looking at that fish, that guy, that, that dog. And, right. Well, I, I'm, I'm wondering, so we, I'm just in this. I'm recording, honey. You're We're okay? live on Facebook, yeah. Oh. So just so you know. We're live on Facebook? Yes. Oh. Everybody can see us. Hey, I didn't say any of that stuff. That's what I was trying to tell you. Well, I'm set it for a reason. Because I'm okay. in the South Field. Um, and it's right. I can't find. So. Okay, let me think. How do I do this share thing? Okay, share. So we're still live? We're, we're yes, sharing we're sharing, and I'm trying to. Um... Hey, we're sharing. It's exciting. How you doing? I'm trying to pull up the book. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, you had it. I have it. I'm just trying to figure out how to do it. Um, <laughs> okay, whatever. Oh, well. You did good. And, and I can't, I gotta think. Okay. Share. It's paused. Okay. Just a giant coyote, <laughs> a dog. I gotta go. You're screen sharing. We gotta go to um, the. I'm just gonna stop sharing and then share again, because that's how I know to do it. I don't know. Podcast on fire. I hate Zoom. Okay. Yeah, we're going to have to have some software that works with the Zoom. It's just to our Zoom out a little bit. Share screen. Okay, this out. is what I want to do. I'm going to share my book. Where is that at? Here it is. This is made to be quality. Share. This is made to be function okay. and utility. We are sharing now, I think. Can everybody see the book? Yep. Okay, so we're on page session two, and then we're on um zoom one page i'm gonna do one page okay so we asked seven thousand people this question when you are in conflict with your spouse or significant other do you feel unloved at that moment or disrespected uh, we were we we're gonna get this part um let's see how do I get my spouse to meet my need? A wife sees her act of love as respectful and a husband sees his act of respect as loving. Thus both wonder, why should my spouse feel disrespected or unloved? Okay. Can a good marriage become better and a poor marriage become good? If goodwill exists, then most conflict is due to a misunderstanding of each person's core value. That's for sure. Right, Ronnie? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open the camera up. So I forgot that I had that off. Let's see if you can see me. Um, come here, zoom, zoom. I forgot we were going to get this. Oh, that's my background. Oh, lovely. Everything's just going great. Um, I know nobody showed up, and so that's just like whatever. That's wonderful. Even the people that wanted us to do this did not show up. I will call you out Zoom. <laughs> no, Zoom and um, Zoomita. I'm not going to call them out, but I am really upset with them. See, I'm upside down. Look, check it out. I was upside down, Ronnie. Well, How do can, I? We can change it. I need to get this um, background to stop. How do I do that? Preferences. Um, uh, background. We'll just turn this background off. So no. I wonder if Why this is too loud. Down? Yeah, it is because it's redlining. So. Why am I upside down? Hello. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Can everybody see us? We are recording. <laughs> oh, yeah, see. Oh, well, you know, you can see right here. Well, so I was, I was trying, we're, we're learning this stuff, so. Um, 
We'll have it down by session 10, I promise. <laughs> Uh, I had to adjust it for him. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have it. This is our first time. Can you see that? Oh. Yes. No. I'm trying to find my book. Can't find it. Uh, I know everything is really sensitive in that mic, too. <laughs> I even yelled at my mom and dad. I feel bad. They're like, we're out to dinner. I said, you can at least show me. You're the only ones that are going to show me support. <laughs> I feel bad. I need to call them and apologize. Okay, so um, yeah, they didn't find it. I told them that I was going live. I mean, I said you can't just open your phone at dinner. Okay, so um, isn't people this? Are, do you want to read this? Is it this too simplistic since so many other problems exist? Well, no, because it solves all the problems. Oh, the, the problems are not the problem. The root issue is an unloving and disrespectful attitude. Though a plethora of issues envelop you, we will have trouble in marriage. We will have trouble in marriage, there's an exclamation mark. Like money problems, in-law struggles, child rearing frustrations, <laughs> health concerns, and the list goes on. It is your loving and respectful response to your spouse during these tensions that leads to marital success. It is hostility and contempt that lead to marital failure, not the troubles. Hmm. It's not what happens to you. It's, it's how you react to it, man. Yeah. It's your response. Yeah, man. You just got to shut up. That's right. <laughs> we don't ever, we never go wrong when we do that. Unless you go, what is a major mistake couples make we believe that he can be unloving to get respect and she can be disrespectful to get love we cannot use unholy means to achieve worthy ends we cannot be negative to motivate another person to be positive we cannot deprive another person of what they need in order to motivate them to meet our needs hmm. yeah isn't that crazy that's good yeah we do that we do that and it's the opposite of what we should do Okay. We wonder why it doesn't work. The love and respect connection. There are important definitions and connections between love and respect. The crazy cycle. Why do we negatively react to each other? When she feels unloved, she reacts with respect. Wait, wait. No, that's not right. Is that a typo? When he feels disrespected, he reacts without, oh, without love. Cause she, okay, without respect. The energizing cycle. How do we motivate a spouse? His love motivates her respect. Her respect motivates his love. The rewarded cycle. What should we do even when a spouse doesn't respond? His love unto Christ blesses regardless of her respect. Her respect unto Christ blesses regardless of his love. So why do we negatively react to each other? When I feel unloved, I react without respect. When you feel disrespected, you react without love. Why? Because we're little children. We just have grown up bodies, but we're still all little children. So 80, 90, doesn't matter how old you are, you're still a little child and you need to do childish things. And and everybody, everybody's hearing me say this going, yeah, that's true. But the real reason is because I don't speak pink or, 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 and, and I don't hear pink and, and you don't speak blue and you don't hear blue. And so God should have gave us this class. Class, like way at the beginning of time, like Adam and Eve time. They should do it because, in high school. Yeah, this is like, I mean, it seems so simple, but it's this is the answer. You know, um, I look weird on the camera. Plus, a lot of problems come of, uh, you know, because of the not understanding and not speaking of it. And, and it makes sense when we hear it here. Yeah. I, I, I practiced this week about agape love. I'm not supposed to say agape love you. I'm supposed to, what's the word? What's that word that they said? Uh, agape um, is, is, is everything. Well, they, he said in the book that you cannot agape love your husband. That, um, I know he said phileo. Phileo, yeah, phileo. phileo. He says that doesn't mean don't, <laughs> not, don't phileo them. Don't phileo them. Phileo. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm Can I tell the thing about when, you know, about, you know, knowing the thing that struck me the most and i keep telling people is, is you know knowing that you didn't wake up 
you have you're 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 a good will you know person you 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 love me and you have good intentions i don't wake you, up you didn't wake up this yeah. morning wanting to attack me well i'm gonna get him today so and i sometimes have to say that too like ronnie i did not wake up hating you yeah, yeah and it helps and to remind me sometimes I'm, getting, I'm to the point where i'm like i don't want to hear that but but and i go yeah that's right so yeah we, we don't intend to hurt each other we didn't wake up going i'm gonna get him i'm gonna get him today no <laughs> so we have to remember that something happens to to pull the trigger you know trip the switch trip the switch yeah so <laughs> It happens. You get on the crazy cycle. So how do we motivate a spouse? His love motivates her respect. Her respect motivates his love. Just be kind and show love and just, you know, don't be a jerk. It might be hard at first, but you keep practicing it, I guess. You get, you know. And you both start getting the results and you're like, hey, man, this works. So I guess you got to start somewhere. What should we do when a spouse doesn't respond? We'll just keep doing it. Well, if they don't respond, that's probably, I mean, what, you want them to respond negatively? No, you just keep all? loving and being kind and eventually yeah. it'll happen. Well, God is love and love never fails. So just remember that. Never fails. Even if it looks like it's not working. It is because love never fails. Men, when your wife reacts negatively in a conflict, try to explain how that comes across to you just as disrespectful. Women, when your husband reacts negatively in a conflict, try to explain how that comes across to you as unloving. Do you find yourselves going round and round with each negative reaction triggering a negative reaction in the other so men when your wife reacts negatively negatively in a conflict try to explain how that comes across to you as disrespectful anybody <laughs> oh is it up, up to me to answer that? nobody's here well, i was just thinking about the crazy cycle going around and around yeah it's not just, just it's not that. just going on its own it's got like little jet engines pushing it and faster and faster if you keep turning the jet engine on it's going to go faster and you just got to turn it off but you can't let's read this part decoding the code discuss how husbands and wives often send messages to each other in code when what they say is not what they really mean that's so me like i am like so between the lines yeah For instance, that's not cool what does a wife mean when she vents who's calling not cool man when she vents you never spend any time with me is she meaning to be disrespectful and condemning or is she crying out to the man who matters to her the most because she wants to experience the love that she can that he can only believe, give her i believe that but also a lot of times you use the word never and always and and it says right here you never spend any yeah time. never that's like that's like a pretty large word never it's like okay so i spent five days with you but i spent half a day doing something else without you and i never spent time with you you know it's like like i don't I haven't any... said that in a long time you say a lot of things you say um, you just said that you read between the lines everything you... yeah you gotta read between it's the like lines. you're trying to set me up um, really do you... okay so what does a husband mean when he says i don't want to talk about it drop it is he saying that he does not love his wife or is he saying that he's losing energy in some of these talks because it comes around to him being inadequate and he feels disrespected for who he is as a human being I'm a, i just see where it's going i I'm, i've been around long enough to and i just I'm, don't want it i don't want that anymore i'm, I'm like stop stop and, and, and you're like no and then the, and then the the woman you know she needs to feel love and she feels love by you talking and you you're gonna have to you're gonna have to learn to Okay, he loves me. I've been with him for fifty years, and um, what well, he 50 said. Fifty years. He said, "I'm not that." I old. told you when we got married. I love you, and if everything ever changes, I'll let you know. Wrongly taking up offense. But yeah, 
I think you know me, but if we don't talk about it, it gets better. If we, stay, you know, it, it, it's just, it's the crazy side of the the wheels. Do you feel offended by by her put down? How can you just code your wife's and ruin her book? Okay, Where are you? Though you feel offended by her put down, how can you decode your wife's vulnerability? I haven't said um at all. <laughs> we watch all these video podcast things and everybody's like, um, uh, um. Fill in the blanks. No, I don't, you don't have to I haven't speak. said um at all. I don't think. You don't have to speak. You don't have to fill in the blanks. You sometimes defensive? silence is a good thing. Yeah. Getting too defensive and thereby becoming offensive. As a husband who refuses to read the marriage book or a wife who reacts emotionally after getting the diet book, <clears throat> explain how your defense reactions I'm come across as, yeah, but you just something else, across as offensive, even as, That's uh, for your health, no. even if this is not your intention. Okay. What is our responsibility as believers to go the extra mile and not appear offensive? Let me look up a few. All right. Well, I guess anytime I talk, I have to say, okay, look. I don't mean anything bad by this, but um, the dog might need some water. You know, I, I don't mean, I don't want to hurt you, and I don't mean anything bad. I don't mean, you know, that, that you're doing a bad job and that, you're, that you hate the dog, you're trying to kill him, and that, um, I mean, really, do I have to say all that every time? Well, there's just, just a, a goofy example, but it feels like, no, really? Don't do anything that causes another person to trip and fall. It does not matter if that person is a Jew or a Greek. Or a, a member of God's church. That's 10 and 32, 1 Corinthians 10 32. If you soften your defensive reactions, how would this stop the crazy stuff? It does stop it. We've done it and it works. It works. Mm -hmm. Judging my spouse is childish. We can too easily judge our spouse's weakness because when they are vulnerable, God gave us natural strengths. For example, because the husband is not bothered by a diet book, he doesn't feel unloved when receiving a diet book he can wrongly judge his wife as childish for feeling unloved and reacting negatively to the diet book and because a wife is not bothered by the third marriage book this year for the two of them to read she wouldn't feel disrespected if he bought a marriage book <laughs> she can wrongly judge her um that was funny mm, let's see there we go this is a good why don't you read this ronnie this is a good one claiming my spouse lacks. Claiming my spouse lacks goodwill. During moments of craziness, a wise person does not impugn motives. About the diet book, a husband needs to discern that after his wife receives the diet book, she is not seeking to emasculate him, but to awaken him to the longing of her heart to be loved by him. She's not intending to be mean. And a wife needs to discern that her husband isn't seeking to be condemning and unloving for getting the diet book. But after she complained about being overweight, he got the diet book to be helpful. <laughs> Every guy makes this mistake once. No, I didn't. About the marriage book. A wife needs to recognize that after her husband receives the third marriage book this year to read, um, he's not trying to crush his wife's spirit by ignoring a book, but to alert her to his feelings. Um, he's not intending to be cruel, but is feeling criticized as unacceptable and losing energy in the marriage. And a husband needs to detect that his wife isn't seeking to be judgmental, and disrespectful by giving him the third marriage book, but he's trying to be helpful. When two people give the benefit of the doubt to each other, trusting each other's goodwill, what happens? And why? Because you don't you 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 don't read it wrong. I mean, you, don't, you may not have it you perfect. But yeah, you don't. It's if if you trust we're... their goodwill, you even though it seems like they're going, <laughs> they're actually smiling and wanting to hug you. No, that's just not okay for a man to give a woman a diet book. It's I, just I didn't not do it. Okay. I didn't. I, I haven't done that. <laughs> right. I haven't given you a marriage book, have I? I mean, many. Oh, you, 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 <laughs> doing a lot of things. I, I didn't go as far as highlighting it, though. What, Who was it that what, highlighted? what are we doing right now? No, I didn't highlight the book, though. No, we're just we're, we're being filmed and, and recording <laughs> it and, and talking about everything. <laughs> microphones and everything ronnie's like all awesome <laughs> hey, the puppy dog's here too yeah kingdom likes to have um <laughs> he's a good boy we we acquired another dog too and oh, i am going to rehome him because kingdom because they don't speak they don't each other's language they don't the crazy cycle it gets bad real it's quick. real bad so i mean they're like spinning around like like 
like the cartoon dogs fighting, <laughs> spinning, you know, like ball of fur. Okay, so. I'm sleepy. Let's see. Here we go. Oh, this is a long tape. Do you have a good one? Okay, this is long. Do we need to read all this? Well. Do you want to read that? I sometimes ask what I think is, are we on section two though? Is this the section? Is this, I did this lot the other night. I was on section two and I didn't know. I mean, I mean three. Then. Okay, let's just read it. Um, midweek devotional. Do you have a goodwill marriage? Oh, it's a devotional. He who seeks good finds goodwill, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Proverbs 11, 27. Right. I am sometimes asked what I think is the most important principle we teach. Pink and blue, not wrong, just different. We were joking around about that the other night. It was funny. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what we said. Not wrong. Just, just different. different. Comes to mind, but so does one simple word, goodwill. When you and your spouse see each other's goodwill, good things are in store for your marriage. When they first hear the word goodwill, people have questions. Just what is goodwill? How can I know I am showing goodwill toward my spouse? How can I be sure my spouse has goodwill toward me? Sorry, my dog is loud. Uh, simple. He wants to play. He's giving me his bone. No, we're gonna. Act he likes to bring us things. Okay, there you go. Um, a simple definition of goodwill is the intention to do good toward another person. But the challenge often some comes in when one spouse does something to the other spouse that does not feel good, loving or respectful, as they as the case may be. It is often just a little thing, but still enough to get the crazy cycle revving up. At moments like these, the offendee has to cut the offender some slack, as in giving up, giving him or her the goodwill benefit of the doubt. A number of verses confirm the goodwill is a biblical idea. See, for example, Proverbs 14, 9, uh, there's the verses, when he warns that husbands and wives can become so concerned about pleasing each other that they can be distracted from serving Christ as they should. Granted, husbands and wives don't always demonstrate the natural desire to please each other as well as they might, but their goodwill is real nothing, nonetheless. That's why today's passage is just so important. When there's conflict, disagreement, or a bump of some kind, don't automatically conclude that your partner has ill will towards you. If you, if you look for evil offense, you can find it every time. Do that and the crazy cycle will spin for sure. What Proverbs 11, 27 is saying to the married couple is look for the good in your spouse, even though it seems like it seems to be lacking. It is quite likely that you will see your spouse's goodwill coming right back at you. The truth is simple. We will see what we look for. That's good. We will see what we look for. I think I could be true sometimes. No matter what happens, always assume your partner has base, basic goodwill towards you. Yes. How does that work in real married life? Here are some examples. Practice. I know of a, ah, oh, what did I just do? This is long. You want to read the rest? Here, right here. I know of one husband who made the decision uh, always to assume his wife had good will. <clears throat> Not only did this simple commitment improve his attitude, but it also changed her entire attitude toward him. <laughs> he writes, I started giving her the benefit of the doubt. I didn't tell her she was disrespectful or anything. The results are stunning. She's been easier to live with. She doesn't nag me as much. She has shown increased interest in my hobbies. And she says I'm like a new person. All this from simply giving her the benefit of the doubt. What does Proverbs 11, 27 say? Look for good and you will find goodwill, sometimes in spades. Or what about the wife who had to spend much of her of the summer apart from her husband because of their different career responsibilities? After several weeks, she went to see him, meeting him at the office where she knew he was under a lot of stress because of the important interview coming up. She hoped for at least a hug or a kiss, but was greeted instead by a preoccupied husband who practically ignored her. Although she was hurt, she asked God to help her remember he makes space. It's like trying to get there and I won't go there. I'm sure it's going to say as a good rule, as a good rule man oh. who simply needed some time to prepare for an important interview. Her prayers and patience paid off. Two hours later, he emerged refreshed and lighter a refreshed and lighter man full of hugs and kisses might take two hours <laughs> they had a wonderful time the rest of the evening as well as over the next several days before learning about goodwill and the pink and blue differences between men and women she would have been she would have belittled her preoccupied husband in no uncertain terms 
This time she turned to God for understanding and felt true peace because she was able to look at the situation from his male blue point of view. Blue point of view. I am blue. <laughs> Does seeking good in your spouse, <laughs> seeking good in your spouse when he or she has not known and has not shown much goodwill always work? Uh, no, not always. But remember this simple but powerful principle. Assuming goodwill in your partner is always the best policy. Keep on seeking the good. Eventually, you will find it and goodwill as well. In prayer, thank the Lord for the goodwill each of you has toward the other. Ask him for strength to give each other the benefit of the doubt during moments when someone's goodwill seems to be lacking. Action. Do, during disagreements and conflicts, tell yourself, my spouse has goodwill toward me, even though it doesn't feel that way right now. We kissed. You Love y'all. You didn't see it on camera. Thanks for um, joining us. Yeah, awesome. Bye We're the then. only ones. Goodbye. Bye. I don't know how to shut it off. Wah, 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 wah.